Okay. Uh, so today I'll be discussing about a uh, few things about some effective techniques uh, that you should uh, probably use while making uh, games on the web. And uh, probably before uh, I get uh, formally started with the discussion, it will be a brief discussion mainly around HTML5 and the things around it. So I have some probably, you know, initially uh, starting point questions for you. So how many of you are JavaScript geeks? So one and a half, half hands, not even a full hand. Okay. Casual JavaScript programmers. Yeah, okay. So form, validate, return, false. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody does that. Okay. Uh, all those who raise partial hands with JavaScript, a very basic question. Is JavaScript object-oriented or object-based? Okay, so I'll just answer that question and leave it out to you to discover later on. JavaScript is an object-oriented language. Probably I'll discuss offline why it is object-oriented language. Oh, it's, it is. Okay. Uh, how many have worked with HTML5? Okay, heard, let, 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 go back. Heard about HTML5 first one. So I think everybody should raise that. Okay. Seen HTML5 in action. Okay. Uh, Design few hello worlds with HTML5. Okay, less hands. Worked extensively with HTML5. Okay, so what all things have you done with HTML5? Most common one, I suppose. That's the most, you know, addictive part of HTML5. Okay. Okay. How many of you developed ever a computer game? So it can be simple shooter game. I hit you, you hit me. Okay. And uh, out of that, how many of them, if at all, have been pure JavaScript games? Okay. So what games have you developed, if you want to reveal? That's okay. I don't want, I mean, you can keep that secret if you don't. <laughs> so let me show you one game. Uh, it's definitely not made by me. Okay. Uh, this all pure HTML5. I'm pretty sure a lot of you would have, I don't know how many of you are addicted to this game. I play this a lot quite often. Okay. This is pure HTML5 game. And there are a lot of things that, uh, uh, okay. So there are a lot of things that would uh, come into picture now when we start designing games using HTML5. So HTML5 brings us a lot of crazy stuff. Probably some of the things that uh, that we would be focusing on, at least I would be focusing on, would be looking at the canvas element that is um, that allows you to do something more like MS Paint or GIMP and gives you a lot of capabilities similar to that. Uh, you have this new audio and video capabilities that uh, allow you to natively uh, play the videos and the audios within the browser. Of course, browsers should support uh, the corresponding codecs. A very f powerful thing that has come up is local storage. Uh, you had heard about uh, Google Gears. Use that. Uh, yeah. So a lot of things were standardized based upon the niche that had come up, and you have now a local storage, and we'll see what it allows us and what are the restrictions and constraints on that. Uh, we have a very powerful history API that has come up in HTML5, and we'll see how we can use that effectively, uh, mainly for the purpose of navigation as far as uh, your gaming is concerned. And then you have a very interesting uh, concept of offline, wherein you can force the HTML5 compliant browsers to cache some of the contents on the client side and very useful when you especially design your games for the mobile devices wherein you're not sure about the connectivity. You know, in the morning we had some hiccups in the demo because the BSNL network connection was not good here. So similarly, you, the guys who are on mobile, they may be travel, they may be in transit and you do not expect. I mean, the guy may be, uh, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in let's say, check-in queue and he may be playing a game and as he enters the plane, there are no network connection, but he would still like to continue the game. He may not be able to submit this course to the server, but would like to continue the game, playing the games. So can we do that? And that may require moving from one page to another. So you may have to move from A.HTML to B.HTML. Can you force the browsers to work even in that offline mode? So build some of those interesting capabilities. Okay. Uh, while working with uh, the word effective, now what is the first thing that comes to your mind? So I'll, I'll make it in a session very interactive rather than me just giving you some lectures or preaching or something. 
So when I say, you know, you have to make this application effective, uh, what does it mean? These are some effective techniques. So UI, okay? Performance. Performing is sab kuch dabbe mein dal diya ek dabbe mein. It is a big black box called performance. Okay. Flow. Okay. It serves the purpose very critically. Should should do what it is supposed to do. Okay. So I'll probably uh, divide this uh, development parameters on the word effective in two broad categories. One would be user centric. So the end user who's uh, you know using that application, using that game, and second is the application or game centric. So what all things that the developer will have to keep in mind a technical guy. So from a user perspective, you have this usability, whatever it means to the user. So usability means uh, may mean using effective use of the keyboards, uh, the mouse. You may want to have uh, uh, what I'll say support for uh, accessibility and other things. Uh, you want a fluid interface. A so fluid interface means the response should not be intermittent. It should be as continuous as possible. So you should, user should not feel a disruption in whatever he is doing. Uh, the application should naturally be very responsive. So as soon as, soon as I you know, click on the button, it should show me some effect. So even it may take three seconds to connect to the server and get me a response back. But during those three seconds, it should show me that something is happening. So I should get a feel that the application is working. And uh, you know, uh, what I call as it may, you may want to have some smart capabilities. So one of the smart capabilities is you may want to keep some of the data on the client side. So, so that when the user logs in again or visits that page again, so instead of you having to decipher via cookies and other things, you just get to the local storage, pick up the old data and start playing the game, continue from where he has left. So the good part of that is you really don't have to worry about quote unquote what you call a session management. So even if there are no cookies, if there are no sessions, you can still make the anonymous user continue with where he left. Uh, then you have from the application perspective or from the game perspective, you would like to worry about somebody said performance. So I'll probably break down performance into various parameters. You have to worry about probably the memory usage on the client side. I mean, obviously, when you work on mobile devices, you don't want to overboard the application with a lot of memory hogs. In fact, uh, I have an... Uh, uh, iPad and believe me, I have said that I am never going to use uh, uh, the default browser Chrome on that. The moment you open three or four windows, I know it's going to hog 150 MB of RAM. If I start playing Angry Birds along with that, it's going to reboot my machine at some point in time. So you have to ensure that whatever applications you create, you have to profile with the kind of browsers that you deploy and the kind of operating system that you have. So it's a lot of work that you have to do in there. Although you have got libraries, say jQueries, and a lot of bunch of libraries, JavaScript libraries are available, but then not every library may be suitable for every browser and every mobile, uh, every uh, device that is there. You have to worry about the speed, the speed of execution. You do not take too many CPU cycles on the client side. You also have to worry about the bandwidth. And uh, periodically, when you work in a social environment, when you have a multiplayer game played on the web uh, using HTML5, so. Uh, not something like Farmville, which is not really a multiplayer game, or not like Cafe World. Uh, Cafe World. So you have uh, Texas Hold'em, you have you play poker online. How many of you play poker? Okay, so got some poker faces. Okay. So uh, that's some bit of uh, multiplayer game because that happens in real time. So you may want to redesign that in HTML5, and then you may have to worry about the pushes from the server, or you may want to periodically pull to the server. So there are various techniques that are available. So what I'll do is I'll just start with the, some of the key elements of HTML5. Yeah. Yes, uh, the reason is uh, it is what the application has to you know, uh, decide in terms. So it does not affect the user experience per se, yeah, size of the data. Uh, what it affects is uh, it may impact the speed. It may impact the, what I'll say, uh, the memory that is there, and it may indirectly impact the user experience. Uh, no, I'm looking at uh, uh, the data. What I'm looking at is, uh, so there are, I mean, you raised a very good point. So two parts of data that is there. So one is the data that you transfer periodically from the server to the client. So I'll put it in the bandwidth and the data requirements there. Then you have the data requirements on the client side. 
Now, if you use uh, old browsers, so you do not have newer browser plugins for Google Gear. So if you design for older browsers and you work with those techniques. So Flash also provides you some bit of a story, which is pretty effective. The only thing is that will not work on iPad uh, or iPhone devices because there's no Flash. So if you work with Flash, you have got some capabilities, you have got some restrictions, and you're confined to some data storage over there. Similarly, if your browser is HTML compliant, now all that data storage definitely takes space on the client side. However, if you are looking for any of you know HTML5 based browsers or henceforth the devices that are there, they are pretty good in terms of memory that they have, and not only in terms of RAM, but also in terms of the storage space that they have. So probably the minimum storage that you will have on any of these devices is about 8 GB. And the browser will generally can go up to like 500, 600 MB of its own cache, which may include your local storage as well. <coughs> so I'll uh, start with uh, the basic stuff, Canvas. Uh, that's probably the most exciting part of HTML5, and that's what most of you would be using. So some of the key features of... Uh, Yes, so you, okay, the, the question is, uh, you know, the constraints around memory. So you cannot ignore the memory which is taken up by your application, but the point is, what will be a good amount of memory to be kept in RAM, and what will be a good amount of memory that you can offload it maybe to a local persistence or maybe to somewhere offload? You can, so that's what we will look at. So that's what we'll explore. So say, for example, if you're playing some games and you go from level one to level two to level three, now, if the user is not connected to the net and you have loaded all the five uh, levels on the client side, so what you may want to do is you may want to not load everything into memory, have it somewhere in the cache, somewhere persistent, and then as and when needed, you load it up. So you can do those things. Okay. So uh, Canvas allows you to draw almost anything that you can think about as far as, as long as it is 2D, and using some uh, transformation techniques, you can create some 3D effects, uh, you know, uh, something like rotations and zooming and zoom out things. So some of the out of the box things that are available is you can draw shapes, you can copy an image and draw onto your canvas, you can take a, a snapshot from a video at a given time and you can again draw it on the canvas, you can do some transformations, you can do scalings and so on. And uh, then there is a very beautiful thing called save and restore, so that's mainly for technical reasons, uh, probably we'll explore some of the things. Now, when you want to, uh, I mean, uh, the guys who are very new to ju probably just a primer for them. Uh, when you work with canvas, uh, the thing that you would uh, be doing generally is you would, you know, draw borders, draw shapes, and so on, and then you will, what are known as draw paths, technically. And then when you want to say that I have done drawing with the path, you will either do a just a stroke, that means draw just a border or you would do a fill and a stroke. So fill will draw it with some the fill color and then draw a border around it. So once you say stroke, your one path is complete and then you can continue with the next paths. So, I mean, those are some of the technical things that are there. So you can, of course, draw shapes and things and finally you will draw this fill and stroke. Now, when you play games, you probably need to do this periodically. So you have this function called set interval that probably you'll be using very frequently to draw that periodically. The moment you do that, there is a pressure on your CPU cycles because something has to be done periodically. And if it's a large image, and if you draw the entire thing again, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of CPU cycles. So I'll start with some... Yeah. Okay, so a lot of things will depend upon what kind of game it is. So uh, there, there is no general rule that I can say whether you have to draw the complete entire screen or entire frame or you just have to draw a portion of it. So if I, you know, probably just go back to this game, you know, if you look at this game, the entire part is static except for these cell cubes that are there. And probably the cell cube which is currently under consideration uh, is something which probably just needs to be redrawn. So you can use things which are very specific to your application. So if I look at this part, uh, I really don't have to redraw the entire, you know, background hexagon. So all of it is a canvas. All of it is a canvas. Yes, in this case, yes. So you can control a small portion of a second canvas. Yeah. So what, okay, uh, I'll do one thing. I'll just draw some 
shapes around a canvas and I'll give you an idea of how things are drawn or probably redrawn and then you can get a feel of it. So what we'll do is we'll just draw a simple rectangle, we'll draw, you know, copy an image and we'll try to take a snapshot of the video and we'll see what interesting things we can do by just a permutation combination of these three things. So what I've done is, uh, if I look at the UI, so I have a simple image. So that shows up. And then I've created a canvas. Now, just a word of caution, the guys who get started with canvas, you know, when you work with HTML, you are used to working with heights and widths in putting in the styles, the CSS styles. Now with canvas, do not forget to put it in the styles and also as the attributes height equals and width equals. Now, both the things will be mandatory, I mean, for the guys who are starting with Canvas. And what I'll do is I'll just draw a rectangle within this Canvas. So now this Canvas has a height of 320 and the width of, sorry, width of 320 and the height of 240 pixels. I'll show you the code. So when I draw a rectangle, I've given some x, y coordinates and I've given some path around it. So the code corresponding to it for drawing a rectangle would be one to get hold of the, con uh, uh, what I'll say, uh, the element reference itself. Then we get hold of what is known as a context. Now, as of now, there are three contexts which are prevalent. So the most common one which is supported across the browsers is 2D that allows you to draw 2D applications. Then you have another specification which is coming. Uh, you guys have worked with OpenGL or heard about OpenGL? So there is a web implementation of that coming up, what is known as WebGL. And again, it's available in two parts, experimental and the final one. Uh, GL experimental is supported only on Chrome right now. Uh, although Firefox 4 supports it, but then there are uh, few constraints along with it. So the portable uh, context that you have access to is context uh, 2D. So you say I'm going to create a path, and this path is actually a rectangle. And this is just that path that I have to create. Now I've defined this path, fill it with whatever is the default color, and maybe draw a border. So it creates right now a black rectangle. So at 0, 0 and whatever is the width and the height. So at 10, 10, the width is 50 and the height is 50. So it gives me a rectangle like this. And if I do not say fill, what it will give me is just this border. So now what you can do is, depending upon what your application is and where your updates are required, you can just update that specific part. So like if I look at uh, this game out here, so you may just need to continually update only this section here, not the entire part. So all of them will be a different canvas no, there will be only one canvas element. So let me, uh, okay, so I'll draw an image. So what I've done is I've copied this image onto it. Now, if I want to update only this portion, I just need to draw a rectangle on it. No, no. So what happens is unless you clear the entire stuff, so there is a method called clear rect. So that will take it to the background. I mean, that will clear the entire area. So unless you do that, it's like uh, you have drawn something on MS Paint, hmm? and on top of it, you draw something more. So only that portion is something that will be affected. So as I said, a lot of things depend upon your game. So if it is like, uh, you know, a shooter game or something, then you may have to re recreate the entire part. If it is, uh, let's say, a game like Scrabble or something, even though it's multiplayer, you may have to just redraw the rectangles wherein uh, the letters have been put. So you may not need to redraw the entire board. So when you say clear, you can clear a specific area? Yes. So similar to the method draw rect, you have a method called clear rect. So you can clear that rectangle and redraw on that part. No, there is no layering in the canvas, so there are no layers supported. So whatever is there, it's just flattened. Yeah. So there is, as I said, so objects you will get when you have multiple layers, right? So once you have drawn a rectangle, it's gone. You just are left with canvas once again. So everything is a flattened image. So if you have to remove something, you will have to clear that entire area and draw the background or whatever you have to draw. Uh, we'll do that part. So animation requires that you probably have to draw it periodically. 
So there is no animation in drawing. Animation is achieved only by drawing it various times with a different output. Again, depends upon where you want to do an animation. Hmm. Then at least, so what, okay, so if you have to draw this portion from here to here and you want to keep the entire image as is, then in that case you will have to redraw complete part. Okay, the reason is because what happens is as you move, you cannot, you know, you cannot say undo what you have done earlier, right? Because there, are, there is no concept of multiple layers of object. So once you have drawn, it's just one item. So as you want to move, you will have to take it back to the previous color. But you do not know what is the previous color, so you'll have to redraw that entire image. Yeah, that's the reason. You cannot. Okay. You yeah. So you cannot uh, fix something in the canvas in the sense that I may want to say I will do something and undo something. That's not possible. So if you want to do that, you may want to keep some state in your own. I mean, if you want to do a partial rendering. So at times you will have to do a trade-off against speed and memory. So if you want to keep multiple chunks in memory, you will have probably better performance and speed, but then it will have an impact on memory. Yeah. Yeah, so you brought a very, you know, good technique which is used uh, by a lot of, you know, designers and game developers. So what you raise the question is, can you have nested canvas? The answer is no. But what you can do is you can have a canvas on top of another canvas. So what will happen is the canvas which is at the back gives you the background and the canvas which is on the top, then you can draw a rectangle. You can move only. So in that case, you don't have to redraw the entire part in the second canvas. Okay. So now let me look at how you can just simply copy an image. So uh, the context that we get handled to from the canvas element, uh, it has a method called draw image. So draw image, the first parameter can take a reference to another canvas. So you can canvas uh, copy contents of one canvas to another. And that is how you can very beautifully create something like, uh, you know, a graphic editor on the web. So you have one canvas on top of the other canvas, as one of you mentioned. So this, the canvas in the background contains the final image. The, con uh, what I'll say, the canvas on the front contains what is he currently drawing. So that will capture all the mouse events. So whatever mouse events are done, you draw on the second canvas, which is which has a higher Z index. So he can see all the effects over there. Once he says commit, you copy this onto the previous image. So whatever is the previous canvas plus this will be copied onto it. So you get X plus Y. And henceforth you can then probably create a complete jump on the web itself. Yes, so draw image actually takes up to eight parameters. The first four parameters defines the origin and the dimensions of the source. And the next force define the origin and the dimensions of the destination. So you can say, I want this part from the original, put it this part. So it may be scaled up, scaled down, zoomed in, zoomed out. All that is possible. So the first parameter can refer to another canvas element. It can refer to another image element also. So what I've got is this image element. So let me just refresh this part. So as I draw an image, it takes this image element and draws it entirely completely over here. So now let me do something with the video. Okay, uh, I need to just some content of the video. Where is that? Okay. Before that, let me just draw something interesting. Uh, So the context allows me to get the entire pixel data if, you, if I want to manipulate each pixel by pixel. So you have this method called get image data. And so I've taken the entire uh, canvas which is drawn. I get this array. 
सो एरे इज एक्स इंटू वाई इंटू थ्री इनफैक्ट इंटू फोर ए आर जी बी कॉर्डिनेट सो अल्फा रेड ग्रीन एंड ब्लू सो वॉट आई एम डूइंग इज आई एम जस्ट इन्वर्टिंग द कलर सो रेड बिकम्स टू फिफ्टी फाइव माइनस रेड ग्रीन बिकम्स सो इट अलाउज मी टू क्रिएट अ निगेटिव ऑफ दैट इमेज सो इफ आई हैव एन इमेज इफ आई क्लिक ऑन दिस बिकम्स अ निगेटिव फॉर दैट इमेज If I click it once again, it gives me the original image once again. So, if I if you want to manipulate each pixel by pixel in an uh, what I'll say in an image, you can do this. The only constraint is when you say put image data, it is the entire structure which is kept at. So these many pixels, starting with origin zero comma zero, draw it. If there are more pixels than that, those will be clipped off. If there are less pixels, then background or whatever is the original image that will be remained as is now let me take up the video part okay okay so this is a very simple uh, just 10 seconds or maybe 5 seconds animation so what i'll do is i'll take a snapshot of this video and draw it onto the canvas and then we'll see some techniques that we'll use and how effectively we can use to create some really wonderful stuff okay let me okay it's so solid So if I click on this, so I've done exactly the same method, okay? Which is just one second. So if I look at the video part, I have done exactly same. Instead of image, I have taken the video. Right. So video is you know a more powerful element which is available in uh, HTML5. It allows you to. i mean take a complete control over the video that you want to play you can play pause rewind you can jump to a specific uh, time if you know the total duration of it so the draw image we have i've told you that i can work with another canvas we have seen we can work with another image and here we can work with another video so now if i do this periodically i can see probably the video right on the canvas itself so how about doing this in the method set interval so let it do that periodically so if i create a method called you know capture this video periodically all i need to do is call this method let's say after every 50 milliseconds so the moment i do this Okay. I, I'll just come to this. I'll just come to this. Okay. Now, when you render a video, you do not have too much control over how it gets rendered. So, for example, you may have, you know, some video, and there may be some targets that you may have to hit. Now, those things cannot be done on top of a video. So now. let's do something even more interesting what i'll do is as far as this video is concerned i'll just hide this video display none simple gone so it looks like that the audio video is playing over there because the video also has an audio it continues to play in the background so it's like you are watching a movie there but it's actually not a movie that you are watching over there okay now this is a canvas you have complete control over what you want to draw on top of it yeah yeah so this is happening so set time out it's like a new thread in javascript right 
and it continues to do that periodically every 50 milliseconds. So it's something like user is watching a video over there, but it's he's actually not watching a video. You are re-rendering it again. So that video is being played over there that nobody sees, and you are showing him that it's something like he's being played over there. Okay. So if I do a rectangle now, it will come, but it will go because the entire thing is being redrawn. You can see that? Right. So what you can do is, if you have a game which probably has some videos and you, let's say probably some target that somebody has to hit. So immediately after you draw this, if I say for example, immediately after I draw this video, Immediately after I draw this video, if I say draw a rectangle, so you see that rectangle permanently over there because immediately after drawing it, you are drawing a rectangle on top of it. Yes. So, but the good part is it gives you a complete video effect. So a video is already designed and you have probably a game or some animation or something more on top of it. You have some question? No? Okay. How can you have a canvas? Can what do you mean by moving on the video? <laughs> Okay, you want to draw this entire uh, video capture at different locations, is what you know. Huh? Okay, so you want this uh, rectangle to be animated. So all you need to do is probably define some coordinates. So let me do one thing. I'll just define some coordinates. Just one second. Uh, no, this okay. So I'm using it in drawing the rectangle. No. No, th th okay, this is not the coordinate, this is the dimensions, width and height. Okay, so because it's running at 50 frames per second, so you see a lot of flickering over there. So you can draw this, so now, you know, you can draw a video and whatever games on top of it. So video can be designed by your graphic animators and things like that, and you can focus on your game cucks. So I think I'll take a pause at uh, this canvas part. Yeah. You'll have to be louder. You're sitting and it's raining. OK, uh, generally, the rendering of the image is pretty fast. If you have, let's say, um, an image which is uh, in 1024 by 768, so some of the metrics that I've got it generally it takes about you know uh, you know uh, 75 to 100 milliseconds to render the entire part. I mean, in the extreme case when you have a lot of things up and running, so generally it will take about five to ten milliseconds to render it. Okay, so uh, when you say draw image, what happens is it takes up the entire image, whatever are the pixelates of that, you know, it knows what is the x and y coordinates and the width and height that you are supposed to, you, that you have taken up for drawing. It may be required to do some computation because the width and the height of the target may be different. So that transformation, it may have to do, it may, you may get a final image which may be skewed if the dimensions are not same. 
and uh, it will just copy, you know, bit by bit copy of whatever is there. And if you notice here, it actually does not do a copy from the screen. It does a copy from the memory. Because the video is not visible, but still you can see the animation of the video. So you can have a lot of images probably loaded in the background, and then you can start copying them onto canvas depending upon what is to be shown. So again, if once the video is paused, it stopped, okay. Yes, so uh, I mean it's a very standard, you know, set interval, clear interval process. What? Right now the video plays in loop, but video has events like it has started, it has paused, and it has stopped. So you can handle that event and you can clear the interval. Video has events, HTML5 video has events. Video loaded, video started, video paused, video started, so again continued, and then video stopped. And of course you have an error loading error. Uh, okay, see, what I would recommend is to stick to Canvas for multiple reasons, uh, except maybe in enterprises uh, where a lot of the companies have not still upgraded from IE6. Most of the consumers, if you're targeting, you know, in playing games and not the enterprise guys, they would have the browsers which would support at least Canvas, if not everything. No, no, no. That's what I'm saying. If you're not targeting them, so i6 does not support, you know, Canvas. So, barring that, uh, you know, audience, everything, everybody else would have now these browsers which would support Canvas. Flash, the problem is iPhone is gone. Entire iPhone market is gone, right? iOS market is gone. Uh, if you work with SVG, you still have different implementations of SVG. And the bad part about SVG is you cannot have all this stuff. You cannot copy it from an image and take this. You cannot. So you'll have to do a lot of lot more hard work in SVG as compared to Canvas. So in fact, the specs of Canvas have been derived after taking the experience of SVG and other things. Yes. Yes. So as I said, there is n there is absolutely no way if I look at the raw UI law API wherein you get a reference to a rectangle or an image or anything that you have drawn. Uh, in our application that we use at our you know in our company, we have created some games and we have created our own uh, what I'll say uh, uh, API wherein we keep track of objects. So you can do and undo and redo because we keep a track of what you have drawn. So you'll have to do that. So JavaScript gaming engines do have support of some objects, but then manage, manipulation of those and management of those and re-rendering of those, it's all up to you. So you can create, the, so you have a beautiful library called uh, Vector3D. Okay, so you can use that to create some 3D effect. It has those translate, zoom in, zoom out things, and you can use that. Okay, so I'll, I'll just quickly go through, I'm just you know, probably running out of time. I'll uh, just quickly browse through some of the items. So, Local storage in HTML5, you've got a new object called local storage. So you can say window.local storage. And you've got a whole bunch of functions. So local storage is a simple key value pair. So key is a simple string, and object can be any of your JSON object. So it will be persisted locally in the cache, in the DB of the browser. And you have an event called on storage. So you can get to know whether the item was added, item was removed. You get to know the key the value that was added or removed or replaced, and maybe a URL at which the value was added or removed. Now there are uh, constraints to while using this uh, local storage. One, all browsers invariably, in fact across the browsers, you have a constant limit of 5 MB storage. So you cannot go beyond 5 MB. And the sad part is you cannot request beyond 5 MB. So 5 MB is the maximum local storage space that you have as of today across all the browsers. So if I look at the spec, it was a recommendation that was given by W3C and all browsers took it as a standard part. No, per domain. 
per domain. So xyz.com, all the pages, everything combined together, you got 5 MB. Opera has that. Okay, I am not aware of any other browser that gives you that prompt. Hmm. Yes, yes, here, yeah. Yeah. So there is, yeah. That's index DB uh, or WebSQL, I think that they use. Yeah, SQL DB, uh, one of these two browsers. I think Parashuram is taking a session on index DB. Okay. Uh, the next thing that you have very interesting is uh, history object. How many of you guys use GitHub? Okay, start using GitHub if you do So if I look at this page, uh, it has got some URL. Hmm. Now, just look at the effect and the UI that you get. If I click on this RES, you see the animation? If I look at the URL, it shows me slash RES. Hmm. If I click on, let's say, drawable HTTPI, the URL changes. By the way, it is not going to another page. It is pure Ajax calls. Okay, but the URL is also being updated. There is no hash that uh, you know working with GWT and all those things you work with. So this is your history API. Let's see what this has to offer and how you can use it in your gaming technique. So you have uh, window dot history available. You have got methods that you can push the state and pop the state. So it takes three parameters: the object that you are pushing it to the state that you may want to use it later on title of the browser that you would like to see on the top, and the URL. Please note that the browser will not fetch the contents of the URL. No. It is just the URL that you will see in the location, in your address bar. It is your responsibility to make an Ajax call, get a request, do animation, whatever you're supposed to do, and do the render. So what it, things that you can do is you can, if you have a multi, uh, what I'll say, multi-level game, go from level one to level two to level three, so right now, initially, the user may be in slash game one slash one. So once he's done, he clicks. Using Ajax, you update the UI, push into the history whatever data you have to push, and you say the URL is now slash game one slash two. So URL will be updated. So the good part is now the user can bookmark that also. So once he goes to slash two, he can directly go to level two. So that is how you can use this uh, history object uh, to your best. Yes, 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 it will be updated in browser history. So if you say push state, it is like location.href equals. If you say replace state, it's like location.replace. So if you say replace state, the current URL will go and the next URL will come into the history. All re relative URLs allowed. Relative URLs. So you cannot go even across subdomain also. Only relative URLs allowed. Then you have uh, this offline cache. So now we have seen local storage. That can be your JavaScript specific cache. But what if your JavaScript itself is not loaded? You cannot work with you know, local storage. So this is very interesting that that has come up in HTML5. All you have to do is in your HTML element, you say manifest equals, and you provide the name of the file. Hmm? So the name of this file is something that will contain a list of files that has to be cached by the browser and has to be kept. So the contents of the file will always, the first line has to be cache, space, manifest, and subsequent lines have to be file1, file2.js, file3.jpg, file4.mp4, file 4 .ov, you know, MP4, file 3 whatever it is. You just have a simple list of files. What the browsers are supposed to do, in fact, all the browsers that support this manifest, so Firefox 4 supports it, Chrome supports it, Safari supports it. 
what they will do is whatever is the manifest file even if these files are never used in the current html what you has been loaded they will in the background fetch all those files keep them in the local storage till the time that page is open so now if you want so if the user has moved from the check in line and has boarded the plane and he does not have network connections and he has to go to level 2 you know that level 2 files will always be available because you have put them in the manifest cache so you can use lot of these a combination of you know whatever this html5 objects that are available to create your you know games very effectively okay uh, what will happen is the moment it goes offline you know there is no network connectivity it will pull the items from the cache the moment it gets a connectivity once again it will just do uh, you know head Uh, request to the server and will check the timestamp or e tag or whatever it is if it has changed it will do so that's how the process behave but there may be a scenario that the files have been cached the network connection is always on but things have changed in that case you won't be able to do unless you periodically check and probably refresh the page once again all all the idea is these are the minimum set of files that you will require to run your game or application even in the offline mode so you may not show a video initially but as you move you may show a video after 5 minutes so you need that video to be cached what is the good practice for this to be cached say again there is no good practice or bad practice it very much depends upon what are the capabilities that you want to provide in an offline mode so you say that okay uh, you will go up to only from level 1 to next two levels so you cache only that data and then as once you reach level 3 you say no network connection found press submit save it in local storage whatever his score is and when you get the connection push it to the server and go to the next level no 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 only that html5 no uh, what else a recursive content around it no 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 content inside it yeah yeah session management on the client side yeah see normally how do you manage the sessions if you look at the server side session management the clients will generally be sent out a cookie right and the ex uh, client is expected to send back the same cookie back to the server now using this local storage what you can do is you can store the state on the client side okay you can use local storage dot set item dot set item and once you load the application you say get item if that item exist you know that he had come earlier and this is the state of that application load it from that state rather than getting it from the server that's how you can do okay uh edugen is a company that we do a lot of corporate training and professional services we have just launched another offshoot of this in college learning so where we do a lot of game based learnings and uh, so right now it's in private betas we're tying up with content providers so in november and you will be seeing a lot of stuff on facebook yeah so uh, i i think probably everybody is waiting for tea right now so no okay there is a next session so he will beat me so he can disperse and we'll take it offline Thank you everybody